Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to Maryland Online's Fall Professional Development Session, Leveraging Micro-Credentials, Bridging the Talent Gap, and Enhancing Student Employability. My name is Kimmy Lichty, and also is the moderator for this session. The chat will be monitored, so if you have questions and or general comments, please feel free to type them into the chat. It's now my pleasure to introduce our speaker, Dr. Christine Crafton, who is the Project and Planning Analyst in the Office of E-Learning, Innovation, and Teaching Excellence at Montgomery College, where she, among her many duties, coordinates the Micro-Credentials Program. I'll now turn it over to Dr. Crafton. Thank you so much, Kimmy, for that introduction. I'm so happy to be here with everybody this morning. Um, I'm going to go through some pieces of micro-credentials with you that we've done at Montgomery College, and um, hopefully we get some nuggets. Q&A throughout, that's fine, um, but also I, I'm going to try to slow it down a little bit so that we can find out how things are going for everybody else. So thank you for having me. Um, and to share this information with you. So let's start with some information about how the talent market remains extremely competitive. In the United States, there are 1.9 open jobs for every unemployed job seeker. Um, 1.9 seems really hard to measure, so let's just round that up to two. So given um, giving candidates, this is giving candidates plenty of choices about where to work. But simultaneously, there's a talent shortage that has reached a record 17 year high as 77% of employers globally can't find the talent they need with the right blend of technical and soft skills. Now, let's refer to these skills as power skills from this point on uh, because many of these are where the power lies with transferable skills. So a little tidbit for you, uh, the U.S. military was the genius behind the term soft skills back in the 1960s. It was their way of differentiating human skills from machine skills. So when we fast forward to today, every employer and their cousin want people with these skills. So emotional intelligence, decision making, teamwork, you know, you know the drill. Um, okay. The technical skills concern an employee's ability to perform a role-specific responsibility. So they include specialized knowledge, technical abilities that enable someone to complete their work. So these are the concepts we teach in our classrooms, where power skills are personal traits and behaviors that are often developed through life experience and can impact uh, an individual's work. They're typically transferable to any job. So Montgomery College has committed to elevating our students' employability by providing various experiential learning opportunities, exercises, renewable assignments, and activities that demonstrate these power skills. Now, both technical and power skills can be learned and developed over time. As an aside, research does show that Gen Z is particularly interested in learning as part of their jobs. So as they rec they do recognize that as technologies change, um, they want to change with them. So employers really do need to evolve and their job will likely change while they are in it. So Gen Z is very aware of that. Um, so knowing that our newest employees, knowing that our newest employees recognize that business needs continue to evolve and the skill gaps will only widen over time, unless employers and employees focus on upskilling and reskilling to keep up with the trends in higher education. So one of those trends is that AI is not just a thing of the future. It's basically setting up our shop in our backyard with nearly half of the private sector businesses ready to jump on the AI bandwagon, um, or they already have. You know, where does that leave a lot of our future employees? So here's the cool part. Um, it's those power skills, those let's call them human-y things that machines can't master. Um, it's more than just doing our jobs. It's about understanding people. It's about connecting and it's about communicating. But we will face it that the modern world is a team sport. We're all part of this massive interconnected web. And with AI joining the team, our human to human connections are more important than ever. So. We remember, you know, I actually think back to when I was a kid and I learned those basic life rules. I think there was a book, All I Really Need to Know, I learned in kindergarten. Those power skills are basically those rules all grown up. So this is where it gets a little tricky 
everyone's shouting from the rooftops about the importance of power skills, but not many are putting their money where their mouth is. And, you know, we wonder why. And, and, and the reason is because, you know, training's a beast. Um, there's a game changer and it's micro credentials. So I think of them as bite-sized badges of expertise. So here I am with my friend, Russell, a devoted wilderness explorer and his companion, Doug, from the movie Up in Walt Disney World, showing off the badges he proudly wears as his walking trophy case. And it speaks to demonstrated competencies. You want to boost your communication or your leadership skills, you grab a micro-credential. Um, it's flexible. They're, ta they're a tailored way to show that you've got the chops without committing to a full-blown degree. And by focusing on the most in-demand skills, we can help ensure that employers have the talent they need to address those changing needs and that employees maintain relevant skill sets because whoever holds the skilled talent holds the key to the future. And I'm looking at Russell here for that because he's got a lot of badges. So let's take a look at the top 10 most in-demand skills globally, according to LinkedIn. So the most in-demand skills for 2023 indicate where employers could face the strongest competition and identify the skills that could help candidates improve their employability. So for many of us like management, communication, and research, they're cross-functional skills that are applicable to a wide range of industries and job functions. So out of these 10 most in-demand skills identified, only one, and that's sales, was included in the last LinkedIn analysis, which was done over three years ago. So the skills that organizations need most are constantly changing. And the companies and the employees that reskill and upskill in the timely manner will be the ones that come out ahead and stay ahead. So focusing professional development opportunities and infusing these competencies into classroom assignments and through experiential learning in these key areas could benefit our students as potential employees and potential as potential employees immensely. So that is how Montgomery College has responded to these needs for several years now um, with our very successful micro-credential program. Um, 425 students, it's actually 427 students now, have earned digital badges in the areas of communication, leadership, intercultural competencies, and many more. So these are not participation trophies. The competencies are aligned with national standards, such as the National Association of Colleges and Employers. There is rigor to them. These are true demonstrations of these competencies. But there's another really cool feature. They are free. And our students respond to these badges in an extremely positive way by accepting them well above the average of badge earners and sharing them on social media platforms and in their resumes. So when we look at the talent shortage across industries, we can identify the disciplines that would benefit from an infusion of micro-credentials into academic programs, both credit and particularly non-credit. So when thinking about how to present this data, um, we decided on three areas ex as examples, you know, not to pick on them, but to highlight the high impact that focusing on these areas would have on our student success. So using data from Maryland Association of Community Colleges shows us that in fiscal year 22, nearly 500 students completed a certificate or a credential in healthcare, over 400 students in IT, and nearly 1,500 students in childcare. So just looking at these industries as examples, we could, you know, just bear with me here, we could allow thousands of our MC students the opportunity to fill skill gaps while we use our micro-credentials mechanism to validate and allow the students to promote their power skills outside of the classroom and into the future-ready workforce. So here are the in-demand power skills that each of these industries is looking for in potential candidates. Now imagine offering these to our students in their programs a nurse with a badge validating demonstrated skills in communication, in critical thinking, in ethics, an IT professional with an MC credential in innovation, in adaptability, in collaboration, 
an educator with the validated credentials in leadership, problem solving, cultural competence, we would be providing yet another way to lift our students up and help them by being even more employable in this competitive job market while filling in that talent shortage. So those are pretty remarkable ideas. And I think that Montgomery College is on that path to do so. Right now, we currently offer over 25 power skill badges to students and employees. Many are issued as part of cohort programs for both students and employees and classroom experiences for students. So these badges represent demonstrated competencies that are aligned with employer needs. They are assessment focused. They can be used to track skills attained through experiential learning exercises, through assignments, and through activities. And we've got a lot in development also. Interest keeps growing. So as more organizations are moving the barriers of formal education requirements during the hiring process, which is happening, Maryland's one of the states moving toward that, these, verifi these verifiable credentials become increasingly important to validating career readiness. So a goal is to add student and employee experiences that are more autonomous, that they give agency over identified individual skill gaps, and then partaking in the activities, the exercises, the learning experiences, a menu of options, if you will, that would be available to select from and fill in and enhance any identified skill gaps. So I, I, this is a slide I, I wanna just point it out. Um, this is a badge that's in development uh, for the communications in the workplace. And um, this is really a demonstration of our commitment to that student agency where faculty are now developing choices for students to demonstrate a particular competency. So what's on the screen is the communications in the workplace badge, which attests to the fact that a recipient has honed the crucial skill of effective communication, whether they're liaising with an organization or whether they're branching out to an external interaction. The badge earner demonstrates abilities in exchanging ideas, in exchanging information, facts, and taking in varied perspectives. Um, how can our students pursue and earn this badge? Our students are presented with a myriad of experiential learning opportunities that manifest those communication expertise in, in practice. They're demonstrating it. So students can engage in meaningful conversations by interviewing communication professionals and industry leaders. They have the opportunity to meld their communicate their skills and talents with community service by volunteering for local projects or nonprofits. Students can exercise their creative muscles by crafting marketing materials or spearheading a social media campaign, either for Montgomery College or an affiliated external organization. Now, for those leaning towards the practical experience, there's the avenue to immerse oneself as an intern in the communication domain. This particular badge started as um, an internship program. And over time, it, we are now developing more opportunities for students so that we can actually come at this with an equity lens. Not a lot of students have time to just do an internship. So there are other opportunities now. Our culturally inclined students can attend a critically and critically review an artistic performance or an art installation, which adds a layer of depth to their communication palette. There are also the platform to contribute to our student newspaper or literary outputs, which allow students to articulate their thoughts and perspectives to a wider audience. And we have, for our digitally savvy learners, producing a podcast, which serves as both a challenge and an opportunity. And of course, the chance to co-present with a faculty member at a conference, which offers a blend of academic and real world communication experience. So in essence, the Communication in the Workplace badge is representing a skill and a journey with rich experiences, learnings, and real world applications. So I also wanna say that while this is still in development, another badge has been uh, adopted, uh, approved, and um, it is for the um, media arts unit. So basically a student taking a dance class or a student taking an Adobe Adobe Create class could simultaneously be earning a badge called professionalism in the arts. 
And it's very similar to the way that this is set up where students have agency over what they're going to choose to do. And there's a point system. It might not be on our website for you to see, but in the background, any faculty member who um, instills, puts this into their coursework is able to offer students this additional verification. So in addition to doing the coursework, students have this option to earn this professionalism in the arts badge as well. I think it really adds some a, a different layer and some value to what these power skills are bringing. So let's talk about the interculturalist badge, which is issued by our anthropology department. And you can see the description of the credential, the skills, the earning criteria, when you click on the earning criteria, it takes you to the rubric that was used by the evaluators, which will list the competencies, the activities used to demonstrate the competency, and the definitions of what developing competent and accomplished mean. So I'll put the rubric in the chat box for you for your review, but it also lives on the Montgomery College website. We're very transparent about what it takes to earn these badges. Let me put it in the chat box for you. So earners and potential employers alike can click on the individual skills to see an entire profile of the information regarding a particular competency or skill. So this badge is optional. It's an optional component to our Anthropology 201 course, Introduction to Sociocultural Anthropology. Every student in the class must complete a participant observ observation project, which is a general education assignment. If students elect to earn the badge, they are also producing a digital storytelling project to go along with their assignment. And this optional experience has been enlightening for the students enrolled in this course. As a matter of fact, I do have a video of one of the students telling us about her experience. And I'd love to share it. So let me just stop sharing for one second and start sharing again, because I don't think I optimized it for sound. Let's try this again. So I want you to hear from Cindy directly. My name is Cindy Tran. I was among one of the very first students at MC to earn the Interculturalist Digital Badge. I earned the badge after completing the ANTH 201 course. And not only is the badge a unique addition to your resume, and very easy <laughs> to add to your LinkedIn, may I say, um, the experience itself is pretty uncomparable. Um, so in order to earn the Interculturalist Digital Badge, students must partake in fieldwork observation and produce a digital story based on their experiences. That in itself was so fun. <laughs> I got to do my fieldwork in person in March 2020, early March 2020. But even my peers who ended up doing theirs virtually had great experiences and learned some amazing things. It truly is an opportunity to try something new and potentially something that you've been meaning to try for a while but didn't have a good reason to. You're gonna meet so many interesting people and learn about life in a way that you simply can't from a classroom. And then once you've completed that field work, you get to compile it in a beautiful, creative and expressive way. I thoroughly enjoyed my experience earning my digital badge. And in addition to being a unique component of my resume, um, it was a great experience and a great talking point for my future applications, interviews, and even sometimes with some friends because I brought some friends along for my fieldwork experience. I would highly recommend not only the badge itself, but all of the experiences that will come with earning it. So Cindy gave us this great overview of her experience. She is not the only student ambassador who has recognized the power of the experiential learning component and the badge itself is a way to set her apart from her peers. So badges can be earned at any point during uh, the certificate and the degree attainment. And even while working on the job, badges can be stored, they can be shared, they're stackable, they're portable, which means they travel with the learner through their lifelong learning journey. So Cindy is always going to have that badge. She's gonna have that connection to MC. She's gonna have that badge. Micro-credentials at MC certify skills attained in academic programs that are not on the transcript, and students do not receive formal college credit for them. They demonstrate student mastery of specific fundamental skills that employers desire. They represent professional development skills attained for students and employees. 
and they're aligned with the University System of Maryland Badging Essential Skills for Transition, or BEST, and like I said before, the National Association of Colleges and Employers Career Readiness Competencies. So while there are a variety of existing generic competency lists, which are considered foundational skills that align with employer needs nationally, there are also opportunities to come up with unit design micro-credentials that are specific to employers' needs locally. There are also opportunities to do a combination of the process. So we start with an existing rubric, for example, and we amend it to meet a unit or program's specific objectives. Always with the um, intent that the student is, uh, or anyone earning the badge, that it is what employers are looking for. So the core goals of our micro-credential program So the core goals of our micro-credential program here at Montgomery College are to meet employers' needs and expectations, as I've been saying a lot. We understand the ever-evolving requirements of the job market. So this program aims to bridge the gap between education and employment, which ensures our students are not just employable, but that they're primed for success in their chosen fields. So it's crucial for our students to be able to demonstrate power skills and competencies. And these skills often transcend traditional curricula and are invaluable in today's professional landscape. Whether our students are aiming to transfer or they're seeking employment, our micro-credentials serve as a testament to their capabilities. Additionally, we recognize that traditional curricula sometimes does not encapsulate all of the power skills employers are looking for. So we're aiming to increase students' access to knowledge, to skills, and abilities obtained during their degree pursuit. We highlight skills that aren't always explicitly outlined, but are really crucial for career advancement. And finally, education is not just about completion. It's about the journey. So for students, understanding their progress can be powerful to motivating them. So our micro-credential program acts as a guiding light providing milestones along an academic journey, offering a mechanism to fill those educational gaps, adding value to the primary academic pursuits. So whether transitioning from a non-credit to a credit course or enhancing existing qualifications, our micro-credentials signify growth and achievement and readiness for the future. So together we're building a future of empowered learners and we're Rec we're recognizing these skills at Montgomery College that are evidence-based. So each micro-credential is grounded in tangible proof of skill and mastery. Incorporates collaboration. Our program thrives on collective input involving both educators and industry stakeholders. It's competency-based. We prioritize um, demonstrable skills over mere seat time or um, just time and seat, basically. It's not about the time spent learning, it's about demonstrating the skills. They always include a rubric, which is clear and standardized criteria, which ensures that consistency and transparency in the assessment. And those rubrics are on our website for anyone to see. Many of them are actually designated as um, Creative Commons licensed, so they're even open. Um, and we have a system in place for attaining the required approvals. So every micro-credential is backed by a vetting process, ensuring its relevance and its value. So as we navigate the landscape of modern education and employment, the principles of our micro-credential program at Montgomery College become even more pivotal. So our students are empowered to acquire badges from cohort programs, from experiential learning experiences and in the classroom, which signifies their continuous learning journey. We foster a community of recognition where educators can create and bestow badges, acknowledging the accomplishments of their students outside of the traditional curriculum. But it's not just about earning the badge, it's about sharing the badge. So students can proudly showcase, showcase these badges um, as unambiguous, verifiable records of their learning. You can put it on LinkedIn, they can have it as their email signature, they can have it on a digital resume, which really enhances their portfolios and what they're bringing to the table. And lastly, as we step into an era of digital authentication, our badges can be easily verifiable. 
We use Credly, a third party vendor, which allows us to have the badges be verifiable. It allows institutions and employers to recognize and accept them as genuine records of achievement. Again, I wanna highlight not just trophies of a participation, but actual rigor is going into what it takes to earn these badges. So at Montgomery College, we're not just about awarding grades, we're championing these power skills. We're, ch we're saying recognition and authenticity is important in learning. So I do have another video of another student um, for a 2021 MC graduate who, want, who earned a change maker batch. So let's hear from Jalissa. Hi, my name is Jalissa Mahano, and I am a proud Montgomery College graduate, class of 2021, and I just recently graduated from the University of Maryland with my degree in government and politics and a minor in technology entrepreneurship. I currently work at Google as a policy writer. This micro, the, I, I, I earned the change maker badge from Montgomery College and this micro credential recognizes the work of students who are engaged in social and environmental justice learning uh, that works towards achieving the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. The way that this micro credential helped me find my current employer is because ever since I earned this credential, I knew that I wanted to work for a company that aligned with my, my values of wanting to work towards the UN Sustainable Development Goals. And I'm proud to say that Google is a company that is working to achieve the goals by 2030. And so I'm very happy that I'm able to, to still use my micro-credential to this day. The way that my micro-credential set me apart in the job market is that this micro-credential helped validate that I've earned skills in creative problem solving, cultural competence, self-awareness, empathy, and persistence. And these are all skills that I use every single day working at an international company where I'm working with people from different countries and different cultural understandings, I am able to apply an empathetic viewpoint on the different cultural contexts of every region that I work in. So I'm proud to say that I continue to use my badge and this badge holds a lot of value and I would, I would recommend it to students to earn these micro-credentials. I'm very grateful for Montgomery College and all my professors who helped me achieve she cuts off a little bit, but I can assure you that she goes on to talk about um, just how thankful she is for this opportunity. And so, you know, we don't have to take our word for it. We hear from Jalissa, there are over 400 and, uh, well, there's 427 students currently who have earned badges at Montgomery College who have a story to tell. So now I'm going to offer just a, a call to action. And that call to action is visit the Microcredentials website. I put the link into the chat box. Um, you know, there's a QR code on the screen for easy access, but you can use the link in the chat box. Um, we have faculty, student, and staff testimonials on that website, so you could see what badges already exist. Think about how you could be part of the solution to close that talent shortage and give students the edge in the marketplace by developing a microcredential in your discipline for students to earn at your institution. So with that, I wanna thank you. I know I did not go the 40 minutes that I said. Um, I hope it wasn't too quick, but I'm happy to entertain questions uh, now if anybody has any. I do have a, a question. Sorry, I should have raised my hand. <laughs> Do you have, hi, Christine, I'm Laura Ellsworth from Prince George's Community College, and, and I manage our digital badging program here. Um, when you said, you know, uh, talking about faculty creating these badges, creating a rubric, and um, what kind of governance do you have? I, I know you said you manage this out of your e-learning office, um, which is a little bit different how we do. I'm, I'm in, I manage our curriculum here um, and our, our programs. Um, so do you have like a committee? That's what I'm trying to ask. Do you have like an advisory committee or how do you, how do you manage um, just looking at the program and, and the aspects of it? Well, great question. I would love to talk to you more, Laura, offline yes, about sure. um, how your <laughs> process too. is. That would be wonderful. Let's, let's connect after this. Um, sure. So yeah, the, the, 
I usually go through some of the history of this and um, I see that Dr. Mills is on the call. Uh, he was one of the creators of the system back when um, the master plan for academic affairs was put together looking for alternate uh, verific alternate credentials for students. And um, that was uh, about, I think, 2017 or 2018 at this point when that went down. And um, I've been in the role uh, since early 2020. And uh, I will say that the pandemic did increase the number of uh, opportunities, right? People were more interested in seeing how they could set students apart now that we were not in the traditional classroom anymore, right? And so, yes, we do have um, a group who is responsible for vetting what comes through. But I will be honest with you, I'm very high touch, Laura. So it usually doesn't get to the committee unless I myself would approve it. Gotcha. Very rarely does something get through that I that I don't think is going to be approved. And um, I say that because we have a system now where if that rigor isn't there, if the proof isn't there, if the rubric is not developed in a way that shows what the competency is, what the activity is going to be, and how it's going to be measured, there's no point in moving it forward to the committee. Once the committee reviews, they'll come back and they usually have suggestions, either naming convention suggestions or, you know, clarification on a competency or how is this activity actually measuring this? And in those cases, we go back to the person who put it through and have a conversation, make the amends, make the changes. And that communications in the badge that I highlighted, um, communication in the uh, in the per, in, in the workplace badge is a perfect example of that, where it went to committee. It was only for an internship. The committee said internships are not equitable. So there yeah. has to be more. And so going back to the group and saying, okay, let's add some more things here has been really a great conversation to have with that equity lens. So there is a structure. Um, I am fortunate to be a point person between the two. Um, you know, like I'm a go-between. But we have had situations where faculty groups would want to meet with the committee, and I've set that up too in the past, if necessary. Um, if, if something just isn't isn't working, having the committee talk directly to the person putting the badge in has been very valuable. Right, and, and I know we'll talk offline, and this is completely separate from your curriculum process, I assume. Completely. Approving. Okay, gotcha. Completely separate, okay. yeah. This, this is a bonus for students. There's no... Right money involved. There's no financial aid involved. If a faculty member wants to put the extra work in into creating this opportunity for students, that's when that happens. If a cohort program that Student Life has created wants to badge, um, you know, a 13-week program students are going through, we have that discussion. So different opportunities where students are having these experiential learning opportunities, but they're not necessarily getting credit for them. So this is a way to give those students that credit. I'll definitely be in touch. Good. Thank you. You're welcome. Dr. Crafton, did you see Molly's question? What has been the impact to the registrar's office in managing this expanded transcript? And do the micro credentials stack to a degree or can they? Thank you. Molly, uh, we do not transcript this, these um, they don't go on the transcript. So it doesn't have it doesn't have any impact on our registrar at all. Um, they are stackable is as in you can learn it, you can have an introductory badge and then earn a badge that's more sophisticated, but they don't stack onto the degree. They are two separate processes. Did that answer the question? And I see Carla has a hand raised. Yeah, I just wanted to know, how did you start this process? And how did you get the faculty to get involved in it? Well, the process started from a um, um, the academic master's plan. Dr. Mills, would you like to um, illuminate us on how it started? Well, I am happy to. That's not why I turned on my video, <laughs> uh, but I am happy to. Yeah, as, as Christine said, Carla, um, this was part of our academic master plan back oh, five, six, seven years ago um, to develop this, these micro-credentials. And we were looking at it from a number of different standpoints. And uh, quite honestly, we got bogged down in the process. 
uh, we were we were looking too big initially, and so uh, we narrowed down our our scope. We narrowed down the committee and really just honed in, as Christine said, on those power skills. And I think that's really helped propel this program. Um, from a faculty standpoint, how did we get their their buy in? I mean, it's been been pretty easy, as Christine said, for those who want to put in that extra effort for their students. Uh, it does help them in in the the workplace uh, to identify their skills such as communication, leadership, inter interculturalism. Um, we're not replacing and not trying to compete with the technical skills that they learn in in the classroom, which is why, to Molly's point, these are not transcripted. Uh, we've we've examined the transcript, and um, it, it's not necessarily an easy process to, to do. Um, but I, I think we got started one, just from a, a very large standpoint, and then just narrowed our scope down. Um, and it's, it's continually being refined, thanks to Christine's great leadership. Where we started in the application we started with uh, a few years ago is not the same as it is now. Okay, and do you find that the students, when they're getting these micro credentials in a class, are more engaged in the class because of it? It's a great question, and we're actually working right now on trying to find ways to capture exactly that answer. Uh, we do have some things. Um, every time a student earns a badge, I send a link for them to record a 30 second testimonial on the experience. And that has helped a lot in gathering, like you saw Cindy, Cindy is like all about it. Cindy is out there, she's already graduated, but she's out there talking about her micro-credential in this way. And like, I will also tell you, we have some anecdotal evidence of students going through our MC Leads program, which is a program put on by our student life, and then the student would go to another cohort program in our equity and inclusion office. And it was a social justice ambassador class or, or cohort. And they said, where's the badge? And so then the person running that program comes to me and says, oh, students are asking for badges. So then we developed a badge for that cohort. So there's a lot of proof that still is anecdotal and some testimonials directly from students saying that this has increased their motivation to either continue something, learn something. We get emails from students asking, how do I earn these badges? Um, where then I have to say, you have to join these cohorts. Um, and we are working on something right now where hopefully by the end of uh, this, by, by June 30th, we'll have some kind of menu for students to do some self-paced options where they can self-identify what skills they want and then taking, and then go through the modules in order to earn um, badges and those power skills. So to answer your question, yes, it's the age old question. We wanna figure out how we are, how we are measuring whether students find these valuable. But the reality is how we can do that is by reaching out to employers and seeing the connection between, are they hiring people with these micro-credentials compared to people with that? So that's another data point that we're looking to try to find a way to gather. Thank you, Christine. You're welcome, Carla. Thank you for the questions. Christine, I have a quick question. Um, you said that the employer, uh, you have a, a pretty high acceptance rate from the employers of your micro-credentials. And I was curious as to whether that is a factor based on the fact that you're a college as opposed to say a private provider or, or an industry provider, do you finally get more acceptance because it's it's a college and you're coming from the education system? Or is that just indifferent? It's a good question, Wendy. I, I think that employers are still a little bit confused by what a micro-credential is, to be honest. Um, and so when we are working to develop and focus on what employers are looking for, we are very um, high, we are like, like you saw that slide where we're thinking about IT, we're thinking about early childhood, we're thinking about, um, you know, the nursing, the healthcare profession. We are really identifying areas where we know there are gaps, uh, as in there are people, there are positions needed, and we need to find the people who have the right combination of those technical skills and those 
power skills, right? And so I don't know that it's an issue of that it's coming from Montgomery College. I think it certainly does help. Montgomery College does ha- is a great institution. And so I do believe that that definitely helps with uh, people recognizing our brand. Um, but I don't know that it would, if, if, if an institution or an organization was meeting the needs of the employer, I'm not so sure it would matter the about the brand. Maybe it would. I guess it would depend on the employer. It's a great question. I just don't have a really great answer for you because Montgomery College does have a great reputation. So I don't know if that's part of the reason or if it's just that the employers we're working with are just happy with what we're providing. Thanks. That, that, that's a good point. Basically. I just gave you more questions. I didn't actually answer your question. So sorry about that. But thank you. <laughs> Anything else in the chat? Yes, I'm, I'm glad Dr. Mills brought up the piece about the connection between the workplace and um the fact that we are focusing on those power skills over those technical skills, because the the classroom already does the technical skill part. We've got that covered. So the the power skills are what take it to the next level. I have another question for you, Christine. I know you all are focused on the power skills. Have you discussed or thought at all about using these for in-house professional development for employees? Oh, we already do, Laura. We're doing that too. Yeah, those, are, those are included in the power skills. Okay. Gotcha. Absolutely. Absolutely. We have uh, actually quite a few badges for employees. I would say about half of our badges are for employees. Yes. Some are directed specifically to faculty, for example. Um, we do have... Uh, professional development cohorts like our Leadership Development Institute, where after you complete it, uh, you earn a badge in leadership. Um, But there's like requirements that come with it, not just going again, not time and seat, but actually demonstration of those competencies. So we are using that quite a bit. Um, But again, they are linked. Even though we are the employer, they are linked to what uh, an educational institution would be looking for in an employee. Um, so we have quite a few of those. We don't have as many, of course, uh, we have more students than we have employees. So we're going to have more badges issued to students, even though they're about half and half. But we absolutely are using it in that way. Christine, can you talk a little bit about how long the process takes? Um, because it's it is a rigorous process as well. Well, a lot of that has to do with the motivation of the people coming to me. So I might have a group of faculty who are very like committed to the process and they can get it done within a few months. Um, and then I have other people who will, it will take literally a year because we're back and forth in writing a rubric, for example. So I would say the average is a semester. Let's just say a semester amount of time um, between the, depending on how the committees come together. So what I mean by that is I really advocate that it's never just an individual coming at me with a badge idea. It should be a group of people. Sometimes that includes a workforce development person. Sometimes that includes somebody from student affairs. It really depends on what is being measured. Um, And so I really highly recommend that people have some partners in the process of the development. And then once they get those partners together, I usually have like an introductory meeting and go through the steps with them, show them what it would mean to create a rubric, um, go through the application process, as in here are the questions you're going to need to answer, who is going to care about this, what what employers do you see, at, you know, where did you get this data about these competencies? Are they aligned with the National Association of Colleges Employers? Like these are the key questions that I'll be asking to get us started in the conversation. If they already have a pretty fully formed idea coming in, some of them do. Some of them come to me and say, I already have this idea. Here's everything. What do I have to do? Usually there's still a conversation that needs to happen because they didn't get it exactly right. And I have heard some back um 
I've heard back from people like the IT department was saying, well, what if I didn't want to talk to you at all? And I just wanted to do this from scratch. There's no indication on the website on how to do that. And I have talked to Mike about this, that I don't want that to be the process. I don't want somebody to be able to go to the website and figure out exactly what they need to do, because undoubtedly they're going to spend time on things that we don't actually want or need. And we need to have that conversation before that happens. So it is a very high touch process. It does take a lot of time, but I feel like other institutions I've talked to throughout the country have like, you know, a thousand badges, but the acceptance rate's really low, or they don't have, you know, the, they might have a lot of badges, but they don't necessarily have the system in place to explain to the students the value of it. And so I would rather spend the time up front getting it right than have a thousand badges that mean nothing. So the process can be anywhere from a couple months to pretty much an entire year, depending on the, the motivation of the people involved. I would say, though, if something came to me today and it was perfect as is, it could probably be done within the month. That's seven seconds of silence. Mm -hmm. Yes, that is also a very good point in the chat that we use Credly, which allows students to have that Credly account where they can leave MC and that badge will always be with them. So they'll always have their Credly account, which is very beneficial. That's good to know. Good to know for when we have our conversation. Well, I'll put my email address into the chat box. If anybody wants to talk to me afterwards, I'm happy to have more conversations about this. Um, very, I just want you to know I'm very passionate about what micro-credentials can do. Um, well, thank you. Um, because I do believe that it adds a layer to um, to our educational experience. You know, it's giving students who might be it, they might be experiencing leadership in their classroom, but no one is necessarily validating that unless there's proof of it, right? And so the professors who take that extra step and give those students that in-classroom activity, the, 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 the coordinators of our cohort programs who take that extra step, it really does make a difference. And we have some really big ones coming down the road. Um, we're starting a uh, professional development um, opportunity for student employees who work at Montgomery College. And that's going to be, hopefully that's going to be badged um, where it's in the approval process right now, but we've got some bigger things on the horizon. And uh, I think that it all really leads to what we're here for, which is student success. So happy to help in the future. If you have ideas or you want to partner on something, I'm into it. My email address is in the chat box. I'll go ahead and put up the completion slide for those of you that need to take a picture of it for your um, proof of attendance. Well, we'd like to thank Dr. Crafton for today's presentation, and we also thank you for joining us today, and we hope that you enjoy the remainder of your day. Thank you. Thank you, everybody.